You know, as I mentioned, we've, we've been doing camps for a while. Um, you know, it's that whole joke about pastors are only at church on Sunday. That has been true. Um, for a while because we've been at camps each week. Uh, it started with a sports and arts camp, which we did here, but then we left for high school camp. Uh, we were back for, or junior high camp, we were back for a week. Um, and then we went to high school, to kids, and now to big kids camp. It's been a lot of camps, and uh, I was blessed enough to take one of my kids to each camp this year, my, my own children. But, uh, you know, we've talked about camps a lot, and w the reason that we're so adamant about camps, and the reason why we push camps so much is because at camps, we get the opportunity to take these kids um, and really introduce them to God in exciting ways. And, uh, you know, each and every camp, we, I was there and I got to see kids go up uh, to the altar, some to, some to accept Christ for the first time, uh, some to actually answer a call into vocational ministry. Um, and just amazing stuff uh, happened. I was just recently, uh, this last week at kids camp, and saw all these kids run up to the altar uh, for prayer as God was just meeting them where they're at. And, and all of this was just amazing to be a part of. And this morning, what we're looking at is this whole idea of God meeting you where you're at. And camps is really our attempt to create this environment where kids can come to know God in just a really powerful way. And, and it's been awesome to see each camp, um, God uh, really honestly um, meeting with these kids, changing their lives, and uh, it's been awesome. But uh, we are still in 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings is a story of a divided nation. Israel has is, is been divided into two different nations. This is a story of their kings um, and the prophets that uh, were doing their ministry in the time of those kings, and so we're going to be looking at one of those stories this morning. Um, as I said, Israel is now broken into two different kingdoms. Uh, in the north is Israel. We refer to that as the northern kingdom. Uh, in the south is Judah. We refer to that as the southern kingdom. And so they're now um, coming to re really honestly their fate. We're going to be talking about the majority of our, or, well, all of this morning, we're going to be talking about the northern kingdom, uh, which is Israel. We're going to be uh, looking at the end of the northern kingdom. Um, so, uh, as I said, there's two different destinies. One, uh, one's going to stick around for longer. The, today, we're going to talk about the end of the northern kingdom. We're going to talk about how it comes to a close. And so, we're going to be starting right about here and going down uh, to the end and talking about uh, what led them to that, how how all of that came to be, and uh, and. Um, but we're going to be uh, looking at all that this morning. But you see, it started a while back for the northern kingdom. They never really got off to a good start. I mean, this is really honestly back months ago we talked about this. But it all started with King Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom. And what happened to the nation of Israel that split them into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom was Solomon, as he started to amass wealth, he also started to amass wives and concubines. And as he did that, Solomon, who honestly had, the, had taken Israel to the biggest it had ever been, had really made them a, an empire, he started to amass all of, these, uh, all of these wives and concubines, but they all came with their own God. And as they brought their gods into the nation of Israel, Solomon started to set up places for them to worship their gods, and then he got involved with the worship of their gods. And as a result, God said, you are going to die as a king of the United Kingdom, but your son is going to lose much of the tribes of Israel. And actually, it says that 10 split off to the north and two stay in the south. And so Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. He gets the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, which is 10 tribes, goes off with a man named Jeroboam, which was one of the commanders of Solomon. And so as he tore apart, as they tore apart the nation through their fighting, it says that Jeroboam had a terrible idea and he starts off his kingship in really an awful way. So Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom is in danger of reverting to the house of David. If these people continue to sacrifice at the Lord's temple in Jerusalem, they will again become loyal to their master Rehoboam, Judah's king, and they will kill me so they can return to Judah's king, Rehoboam. 
So the king asked for advice and then made two gold calves. And he said to the people, it's too far for you to go all the way up to Jerusalem. Look, Israel, here are your gods who brought you out from the land of Egypt. So he casts two calves to replace the God of Israel. And he puts them in two different places because he tells everybody, hey, it's too far to walk all the way to Jerusalem. You should just worship God here. And so he put one calf in Bethel and the other he placed in Dan. And so Jeroboam is seeking to create in the northern kingdom a place for people to worship. And in doing so, he sets up this alternative belief system where these calves are the ones that brought you out of Egypt, not Yahweh. And he also set up other high places, and his goal was really to get political gain. But he fractures the nation of Israel, not just by region and governance, but by their belief systems. And so he sets up this religion in the north that is nothing like the religion that is going on in the south, which is the true religion, the, fo- the followers of Yahweh. He, ma- he breaks the nation apart. He gives them this second religion, but he also takes all of the festivals that they're doing in Jerusalem, and he holds them in the north, all out of the desire to make sure that these people never go back down to the south and go, oh, we're back in Jerusalem. Isn't it wonderful? Let's go back to Rehoboam. His fear is that they'll do that. And so because of that, he sets up this other religion, which is not at all what God had called them to do. But you see, when Jeroboam starts this belief system, the worship of these calves, it actually continues through every king that Israel ever has. None of them return to Yahweh. And so as a result, God starts sending messengers to the northern kingdom, which we talked about. We looked at Elijah. We looked at all of the amazing things that God had done through his ministry and the ways in which he was calling kings back. Most dramatically with Ahab, they were constantly going back and forth between who God is and return to God, but it never happened throughout his entire lifetime. They never all returned to God despite steps that he had taken forward to get the Baal worship out, still the kings never fully returned to Yahweh. And then Elisha shows up, and it's the same story. Elisha gains ground and is constantly pushing for them to return to God, to return to Yahweh, but they never do. They continue to move further and further away from God. And so they keep going, following their religion of worshiping calves, and it doesn't change anything despite the prophets that are sent to them, despite all the efforts to the contrary. And it says this, but Jehu, we talked about Jehu a couple weeks ago, how God gave him the mission to wipe out the family of Ahab. It said, but Jehu wasn't careful to keep the Lord God of Israel's instruction with all his heart. He didn't deviate from the sins that Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. Last week, we talked about Joash, who was a king of the southern kingdom. The week before that, we talked about Jehu and how God used him to unfold his plan in the northern kingdom. But at the end of his reign, it actually says he never walked away from the sins that Jeroboam had set up. And so there's just a constant spiral down for the northern kingdom. So this week... We're actually going to be walking all the way to the fall of the northern kingdom. So we've got a lot of years and a lot of terrain to traverse this morning. So all the kings of Israel after Jehu, they just do the same thing. Each time it says that they became king and they followed the sins of Jeroboam. Every single time that comes up and it becomes a referring a recurring theme, and then there's also murder of the previous king to seize control, and all of this is going on in the northern kingdom, and things are going crazy, and the mess is just getting worse as time goes on. And then it says Assyria comes to power in the north, and they start to march into Samaria, into Israel to take over, and the kings, Menahem, which actually was the first, started to pay, pay tribute just so that they could have some shred of dignity and power. He actually becomes a vassal of Assyria. He's now serving Assyria. And it's not long 
until they're actually completely destroyed by the nation of Assyria because all of their reigns move them closer to destruction and Assyria takes Samaria. So what happened is Hosea had this great idea. They're already a vassal of Assyria, and so he goes, here's what I'm going to do. I'll pay them tribute, but I'm going to send messengers down to Egypt to see if we can get a better deal, because he thinks maybe we'll get a discount ruler uh, if we go to Egypt for help, and we can get rid of the Assyrians. And so the Assyrians heard of that, heard about that. We're not too happy, for obvious reasons, and it says that they then decide to launch this three-year war against Samaria. At the end of it, the city is destroyed, and all of the people in the northern kingdom go into exile. And that happens in 721 BC. Now see, exile, the reason for it is actually it's an ingenious way to deal with people in the ancient world. Is what they did is they would take all of the conquered people and they would move them off to another place in the empire. So the Assyrians take all the people of Israel, all the people in the northern kingdom, and they move them to another part of the empire. And then they take people and resettle the northern kingdom. Now, the reason why they move the people in the northern kingdom is because people in an unknown city are less likely to revolt. They're less likely to rise up against their rulers because they don't have the internet. They have no way to ha have any understanding of where they're at, how they got there, or how to get home. And so it says that they're going to move them outside of the northern kingdom so that they're completely disoriented. And then they take other tribes, other people that are a part of the Assyrian Empire, and they move them into the new territory. They rebuild the cities, and they create a power base in the northern kingdom. And that's why they go through the process of exile. And the reason for this exile is just because they've rejected God. It says that they started to set up more high places to worship at. They start to burn their children alive to serve these other gods. It's not like they just went, oh, well, let's just adopt a different belief system as casually as we, as, uh, as Americans would do. No, this is a full devotion to these other gods. The fact that they would burn infants, that's a full devotion to a foreign god. And that's what the nation of Israel had started doing. That's what their kings had started to do in worship of these other gods. And so, it says that despite all of this, God sent them prophets to call them back, and every single time, they rejected the prophets that were sent to them, and they followed in the sin of Jeroboam all the way to the exile. They're committed to going after these other gods. And they never actually return. They are displaced, and they never come home. They never get back to the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is gone forever after the exile. The Assyrian king brought people from Babylon, Cuth, Ava, Hamath, and Seraphim, and settled them in the cities of Samaria in the place of the Israelites. These people took control of Samaria and settled in its cities. But when they began to live there, they didn't worship the Lord. So the Lord sent lions against them, and the lions began to kill them. Well, well, not these lions. These lions are incredibly easy to get away from, so there's no real danger there. That's the lions that we're talking about. So what happens is, as these people from other tribes settle in the area, it says that God sends lions to eat them because they're doing their own thing, worshiping their own gods. And so this gets reported back to the king of Assyria. So Assyria's king was told about this. The nations you sent into exile and resettled in the cities of Samaria don't know the religious practices of the local god. He sent lions against them, and the lions are killing them because none of them know the religious practices of the local God. And I know that all of you are going, what in the world are they talking about the local God? You see, the worldview of ancient people was this. Gods occupy the same time and space that we do. They just live on the top of mountains. And as they live on the top of mountains, they can see their entire region. 
So they believe that gods actually lived in places on earth and that if they lived in that region, region that ter territory belonged to them. Just like governors, just like kings. Gods lived in places. And so their worldview was that because Israel's God lived in that land and they were not worshiping him, he's really angry with them and he's sending lions to eat them because he's being forgotten and that makes him upset. And because they're living in his territory, they need to make sure that they worship him. So they actually believed that Yahweh was the local God as in he lived in the northern kingdom. And so because of that, and the, the idea that these lions were eating people, they're like, no, that God's upset. We need to make sure that we take care of that God as well. So think about it in this way. When you travel, as I did recently, you have to give a visa, get a visa to occupy certain countries. And you have to, you know, do all of the requirements. You have to follow the laws. Otherwise, it can go really bad for you. And so not only do you have to get a visa... You also have to go to church is the whole idea here. Is not, if you're going to go into this country, if you're going to walk across it, if you're going to stay there for any extended amount of time, you need to make sure that you worship that God or else he's going to do something bad to you. That's their worldview. Is that Yahweh sitting on top of his mountain is really upset with all the worship of other gods and so we need to make sure that we please him as well as our other gods. And so that's the worldview. This is why when foreign wives were brought into Israel by the kings, it's such a big deal. When their gods were coming in because that was viewed as an invasion of Yahweh's space. And that's why it was such a big deal. That's why when the Syrian general came in and received healing from God via Elisha, he said, hey, can I take this world barrel full of earth back to where I live so I can worship God there too? Because he said, because his belief was, I can't worship unless I actually have the dirt from here where Yahweh's in charge. I know this is a foreign concept to us, but that's how they viewed the world, and that's why they did these things, and that's why they had this view of what a local God is. So, the Assyrian king commanded, return one of the priests that you exiled from there. He should go back and live there. He should teach them the religious practices of the local God. So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria went back. He lived in Bethel and taught the people how to worship the Lord. So it sounds great, right? They're going to get back to doing what they're supposed to do. They're going to get back to worshiping God. But you see, the thing is, they've got these awful patterns because they're going to start worshiping Yahweh again. But they're also going to worship their gods as well. And they've got all these bizarre gods with bizarre worship rituals that are going on in the nation of Israel again. And so there's this pattern that is constantly set up in the northern kingdom where there's no loyalty to Yahweh. It's just become this whole idea of God plus other things. But the priesthood pleaded with the people. Instead, worship only the Lord. He's the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great strength and an outstretched arm. Bow down to him. Sacrifice to him. You must carefully keep the regulations and case laws, the instruction and the commandment that, wrote, that he wrote to you. Don't worship other gods. Don't forget the covenant that I made with you. Don't worship other gods. Instead, worship only the Lord your God. He will rescue you from your enemy's power. But their pleading with them made absolutely no difference. It said they wouldn't listen. Instead, they continued doing their former religious practices. So these nations worship the Lord, but they also serve their idols. The children and the grandchildren are doing the very same thing their parents did, and that's how things still are today at the time in which this book was written. You see, there's a history of compromise in the northern kingdom. It seems like they're less worried about pleasing God and more worried about what's easy and what's convenient. 
Jeroboam set up this worship in the north just because it made more sense to him to make sure people weren't traveling to Jerusalem. And every other king kept the same thing going because, you know, once you compromise once, what's the big deal? No lightning bolt came down from the sky, so it must not be a big deal. And that's how compromise happens. You feel like, well, God's going to stop me from doing this if it's really a big deal. Oh, oh, I sinned and it, it didn't make a difference. Oh, I guess it's not a big deal. I guess I can go on doing this. And that's how they got to where they are, is there's this history of compromise, of just going, well, if I dabble in this area and nothing ha bad happens, then I guess I can keep doing it. Because that's just how we are. I watch my kids do it all the time. I'll tell my youngest not to do something, and then I'll watch through the window as he does it. And then I'll wait a day or two and then go, I know what you did. And then he's like, oh my goodness! He's got eyes everywhere. I said, no, you're just unobservant. I'm standing behind you. But it's just, it's just who we are as people. We will compromise if it makes sense in the moment. But you see, God is not a God that is willing to share. He expects loyalty out of his people, but they've come to this place where they have this religion of God and. And it can be different things. It can be like, oh, no, I, I, I truly believe in God, and I devote myself to him and politics, so I'm, I'm good. Or, you know, I, I, God is the center of my life right after my job. We have this divided loyalty that can seep into our lives so easy, easily. And I've heard many people will be like, well, you know, I, I, I go to church, but karma, I think, is a real thing. Or, or I, I go to church, but, you know, I, I try to send out good vibes to the universe. I don't know what that means. But there seems to be this idea that we can just lump God in with our life, but when we come to know who Jesus is, he wants to remake our life and not be a part of what we do, but be the center of what we do. And that's what this story is all about. You see, it's that whole idea of God and I have an understanding. You know, I, I know you go to church, but we have this great relationship. He gets me. You know, so I don't have to actually do all the stuff that you do because, you know, God gets it. God knows how hard my life is. So we have a, we have a different relationship. You see, but as this nation starts to go down in the spiral again, things really had to change. And as we understand what the, nation, the northern kingdom is actually like, and we understand who Jesus is, and he came to put things back together, we really do hear the story of the Samaritan woman in a new and different way. Because the people that are put into the northern kingdom become the Samaritans of Jesus' day. So when he starts to go through Samaria in his travels with the disciples, and he goes into a town, and he finds himself at the well, having a good conversation with a woman from that town, the fact that he would speak to her blows her mind. The fact that a Jew would have a relationship with who they viewed as inferior in the north is crazy. You see, Behind this conversation that Jesus has with her is a history of conflict, is a history of confusion, is a history of suspicion, is a history of hatred. All of this that has been going on since the northern kingdom fell and these other people, other people groups came in. All of this baggage is coming to a head in Jesus going to her and having a conversation and it goes like this. The woman said, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it's necessary to worship in Jerusalem. This is a question of where does God live? In Samaria, they believe that God lived up on Mount Gerizim, and the Jews believe that God lived in Jerusalem. 
And so she goes, you, prophet, where does God live? Let's settle this once and for all. Because I want to know, is he on this mountain or is he in that temple? And Jesus says something to her that is revolutionary to their worldview. Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. This is blowing her mind because it's shattering the worldview that they had. God doesn't live on mountains. God doesn't live in temples. He's closer than you realize because Jesus is standing in front of her revealing who God is is you and your people worship what you don't know we worship what we know because salvation is from the jews but the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth the father looks for those who worship him this way god is spirit and it's necessary to worship god in spirit and truth so he's talking about this new way that doesn't make any sense. It's not, he says it's not about location anymore. God comes to you and meets you where you're at. And guess what? He was already there. When you come to the end of what you can do on your own strength, God's already there waiting because he's not confined by geography. He goes, you need to understand this. It's not about the place that you go to worship. It's about who God is. And that he comes to you. He goes, you can worship in spirit and truth. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to reveal who God is. He came to enable us to worship God in this way through his death and resurrection and giving of the Holy Spirit so that we worship him in spirit and in truth with full knowledge of who God is revealed through Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Can we worship him and we don't have to go to a place to try to find out where God lives because he is everywhere. And it's no longer about these local gods, but it's God, the God of everything, and he always was. And Jesus came to reveal that and to undo all of the mess that happened in the northern kingdom and all of the mess that we're going to see that happens in the southern kingdom. Jesus comes to restore all of that. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who's called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach everything to us. And Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. He's come to undo the mess and to restore his people in relationship with him. You see... All the other nations were to look to Israel to see what it means to be in relationship with God. They never really do a good job at that. So Jesus comes himself to reveal who God is, and he starts to put the world back together. He starts to draw people back to himself, and he changes each and every one of our lives as he draws us to him. And he places himself in the center of our life when he comes to be our savior. So if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, I want to challenge you. Is God the center of your life? Or are you living with a split loyalty? Are you putting all of your energy and time behind Showing the world through your work, through your friends, to your kids. Are you showing them that God is truly the most important thing in your life? But if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, this morning you're going to get an opportunity to do so. We see, we talk about Jesus in three different ways. We talk about him as our Savior. We can't do enough good stuff to earn our, earn our way into the kingdom of God. So we need a savior, and that's who Jesus is. We also talk about him as being our king. He doesn't save us so that we can be kings of our own kingdom. He saves us, places, his, 
places us in his kingdom, and we learn to do what the king says. He's also our friend. He shows us our world through his eyes. He shows us the people that we encounter and how much he loves them and teaches us to love them the same way. So if you want to be a follower of Jesus this morning, I'm going to pray a prayer in just a few moments, and you can do that. So let's, uh, let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you've given us your word. And I pray that those of us who are followers of Jesus will put all of our time and attention into making you the center of our life. May we show others who you are by the way that we live so that they might want to come to know you as well. But I pray for those who've never given their life to you, that they might make that decision this morning. So if you want to pray to receive Christ, I'm going to say these words out loud. If you say them in your head, God will meet you right where you're at and change your life today. So say these words after me. Father God, I need you. Be my Savior. because I cannot save myself. Be my king. May I learn to do what the king says. Be my friend. Show me my world through your eyes. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. It starts for me today. Amen.